I've been associated with the institution for almost two decades now. Friends, today we have the honor and the privilege of hosting two of the most dynamic ministers in the Canadian and the Indian government. Please join me in welcoming Mary A, Canada's Minister of Small Business, Export Promotion and International Trade, and Honorable Deep Singh Puri, Minister of State for Commerce and Industry, the Government of India. He's also the Minister of State for Housing and Urban Affairs with an independent charge, and also uh, the uh, additional charge, Civil Aviation. Mr. Piyush Goyal had confirmed to participate in today's program, but had to withdraw suddenly as he was urgently called in to India's upper house, the Rajya Sabha, where he is also the deputy leader. The theme of today's program is enhancing Canada-India trade by enabling variety, volume, and velocity. The program today is divided in two parts. In the first part, we will have the two ministers address the audience, give their perspective on Canada and India bilateral relations, and then interact in a QA session with me. The second part of the program comprises a special address by His Excellency Mr. Ajay Bisaria, the High Commissioner of India to Canada and His Excellency Mr. Nadir Patel, the High Commissioner of Canada to India. Thereafter, we would also have a panel discussion among representatives of Canadian and Indian trade and business organizations. I will take a brief moment uh, and the opportunity to briefly introduce our chamber to all the esteemed guests. The Indo-Canada Chamber of Commerce is a 43-year-old Toronto-based bilateral chamber that fosters bilateral trade between Canada and India and creates business and professional opportunities for the Indo-Canadian small business owners. We are the largest Indian diaspora business organization in Canada and are the representative body for small business. We have five councils in Canada and a chapter in India. In recognition of Pumper's contribution to promoting bilateral relations, the Government of India honored our chamber with the Pravasi Bharti Samman Award in 2012. This is the highest civilian award that the Government of India bestows on overseas Indians and Indian organizations. For the last 27 years, our chamber has annually recognized Indo-Canadians for their achievements in 11 different categories at our annual awards in Galanite. These awards are our community's most celebrated recognition. And I can go on and on, but I think in the interest of time, I would now take a brief moment to introduce our uh, ministers today. Uh, though both of them are known public figures and don't need any introduction. But for the benefit of audience from uh, other countries, I would do a brief intro. Honorable Mary Ng is the Canada's Minister of Small Business, Export Promotion and International Trade. She has two decades of experience in the areas of education, women leadership, job creation and entrepreneurship. Her involvement with the Ontario Public Service, the Ryerson University, and the Ontario Ministry of Education has led her to her recognition as one of the Canada's top performing public sector leaders. Honorable Minister Hardeep Singh Puri is again the Minister of State for Commerce and Industry. He is holding also the charge of Minister of State for Housing and Urban Affairs and Civil Aviation for Government of India. Prior to his career in public life, he was a career diplomat from the Indian Foreign Service who held senior positions in the government. He has also served as the permanent representative of India to the United Nations from 2009 to 2013. I think moving further, I would now invite uh, Minister Ng to share her perspective 
on giving a fresh impetus to Canada India bilateral relations. Thank you so very much, uh, Pramod. It's always good to be here with you and with the chamber. I also see my good friend Goldie Hyder is here as well. So uh, lovely to see you and uh, and welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for the high commissioners uh, for Canada and for India to both be here as well. And uh, and I know that uh, you will lead a excellent uh, conversation. Welcome, uh, my colleagues. Uh, several members of Parliament uh, are here. My colleagues uh, joining us today. I couldn't do my job without the good work that they do uh, in the community, but as exemplary um, parliamentarians as well. Uh, members of Parliament, Raj Sani, uh, uh, Ramash Singha, and Sonia Sidhu. So, uh, so welcome, colleagues, um, and uh, and of course. It is terrific to be a part of a discussion with um, with my uh, wonderful colleague uh, from India in Minister Puri. And again, uh, my uh, sincere, um, you know, my sincere hello and welcome to you. Um, but also, uh, again, extending those good greetings to uh, to to my good friend Minister Goyal, who I understand having been called away to uh, you know to any of the chambers. In So, uh, so it is terrific to be here, and um, and uh, and good evening for those of you who are watching uh, us from India, and for those of you here in Canada. Very good morning to all of you, and I can't thank the Canada Indo Canada Chamber of Commerce enough uh, for the good work you continue to do, and for bringing us together. Uh, I don't need to go into all of those accolades, but really is that very um, good and consistent. Um, and helpful work that you and the chamber continue to do to uh, to continue helping businesses on both in both countries continue to build those opportunities. Your hard work, your advocacy, you're really helping to strengthen that economic relationship between Canada and India, and we appreciate it. And we know that today, more than ever, certainly during this difficult time that our international community needs to be working more than ever together. And it truly has been a difficult time for people around the world. We're all fighting COVID-19. We're working to make sure the health and safety of our people is at our absolute uh, top priority. But we're doing this while also mitigating the economic impact of that pandemic so that we can keep our businesses working, um, and uh, and our trade flowing and uh, international collaboration is of course uh, really important as this many countries uh, in the course of this uh, has uh, responded early on for a range of reasons by closing their doors to trade and I know that uh, you know we've certainly had this conversation between India and Canada that COVID-19 shouldn't and cannot be used as an excuse uh, to stop trading and this is a vital time and it's critical that we work together to make sure that uh, our people get access to the essential goods and the services that they need. Um, my counterpart, of course, in Minister Goyal played an influential role in making sure that essential pharmaceutical products and medical medicine can flow from India to Canada throughout this uh, crisis. And, uh, and, uh, and, and we appreciate that. And this is an exact, you know, exactly that excellent example of this effort. And uh, Minister Puri, you're here with us today. And, you know, and I, and I want to thank you as well on behalf of uh, Canadians. You were so um, instrumental uh, in facilitating those repatriation flights of Canadians in India returning to Canada at the very height of this crisis. So um, my appreciation, our appreciation. Um, and uh, Canada is truly a trading nation. Before COVID-19, um, trade accounts for nearly two thirds of Canada's economy. So it's really important to the jobs of uh, to, to the jobs here in Canada. And as we all work to help our people rebuild and recover from COVID-19, trade is going to continue to play a crucial role, which is why I've been working with international colleagues to eliminate unnecessary trade barriers helping Canada and India strengthen trade in already well-established sectors such as pulp, paper, agri-food and automotive. But this work with the international community will also help us grow in emerging sectors um, such as, uh, you know, such as in clean energy, in clean technology, in education, skills and training, 
urban and transportation infrastructure that's green infrastructure. Uh, so there are there are opportunities. And as we work together to help our businesses in the months ahead, Canada is absolutely committed to strengthening that direct investment relationship between our two countries as well. Um, two way investment, direct investment, foreign direct investment between Canada last year. Canada and India reached 3.5 billion and the Canadian portfolio of investments. Uh, uh, it's really important to also, uh, you know, we're proud of this. Uh, the Canadian portfolio of investments have grown substantially over the past five years and now exceed. Dollars. Uh, let's look at uh, Canada's Bombardier as an example. Its rail cars are moving more than 5 million people daily through Mumbai and in Delhi. And the company recently signed a $171 million contract to deliver 67 trains, which will be built in India uh, to the Uttar uh, Pradesh Metro Rail Corporation. And here, uh, Ottawa's Clearford Water Systems is helping uh, people uh, who live in India's countryside. So supplying more than uh, 1,500 people in Gujarat with improved hygiene and sanitation using a patented wa wastewater system that uses minimal electricity. This is the kind of innovative, uh, you know, it's an innovative Canadian company. And I know when we say sort of, you know, the small numbers uh, that it's helping right now, kind of in, in, you know, they're big numbers in Canada, but smaller numbers, you know, in, in, in the India context. But nonetheless, what it means is that it's a, you know, it's a sustainable model for sanitation in rural India. And these are, these are the kinds on it as the road ahead, we're going to want to work together to create more, the opportunities for more Canadian investments in India, mutually beneficial stories like the two I just talked about. And for Canada, the path is very clear. We're going to protect the health and safety of our people and our businesses and support them economically. Um, and uh, this will include helping them grow, scale up, but scale up by accessing vibrant markets like in India and uh, beyond the wide range of um, supports uh, during this emo uh, during this emergency to small business owners and uh, and entrepreneurs, Canada continues to look for ways to help our businesses become more export ready to enter into those markets um, like India. So it's going to be it's going to be important for us to keep doing this work to make sure our supply chains remain resilient, accelerate that growth uh, throughout the economy in those emerging sectors like clean tech um, and agriculture and Indians, um, access those markets and Indian uh, companies to also uh, access our market. I mean, literally to do that two way uh, two way opportunities. And I think that it always begins with a good relationship. And I'm really thrilled to have had the benefit to continue to work with my colleague. When I think about the last five months, um, I've spoken to Minister Goyal on four occasions. Uh, so four occasions in five months is uh, is uh, is is uh, is quite uh, is quite significant. I mean, uh, but it also indicates how important this and my colleague Minister Champagne, the foreign min foreign minister, have of course always been in touch with uh, uh, with his counterpart in Minister Jai Shankar, who we both were able to host here in Canada before the pandemic, and that was terrific. And of course, Prime Minister Trudeau has had multi you know multiple conversations with Prime Minister Modi. So those discussions, along with uh, at the government level, along with today, members bring businesses together um, means our ability to work together to help our people, our businesses, our workers is absolutely crucial. And I'll end with uh, the Chambers model, which is grow, engage, and prosper. So here's to that continued growth, continued engagement, and continued prosperity. Thank you so much uh, for allowing me some time to speak to you this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Ang, uh, for your opening remarks and kind words. Thank you very much. I would now invite uh, Minister Puri to share his insight on putting India's trade with Canada on a high and rapid growth trajectory. Minister Puri, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Goyal. Um, thank you very much, Minister. Let me start by conveying the greetings from my friend and colleague, uh, Mr. Piyush Goyal. Uh, when he mentioned to me late this evening that um, um, I would have to stand in for him, I must say. I did not hesitate for a moment, even though I've had a very long day um, in both houses of parliament. Uh, it's always a pleasure to interact with Canada, with your representatives. Um, in the interest of full disclosure, Mr. Goel already mentioned 
I had a life before this and I spent nearly four decades um, in the Foreign Service and I've had many friends in the Canadian uh, system in, uh, in, in your um, world of your diplomats, people I've served with, I've served with many of your leaders. I had the privilege of being assigned by the Prime Minister to accompany uh, Prime Minister Trudeau during his visit to India when he went to the Golden Temple in Amritsar. So it's a pleasure. Uh, I think the subject or the theme that you have chosen, uh, Mr. Goyal, uh, on behalf of the Indo-Canada Chamber of Commerce, uh, enhancing Canada-India trade, and I particularly like the variety, volume, and velocity part. Uh, because I think if you look at the quantum of overall bilateral trade between these two uh, vibrant democracies, uh, forgive me if I have to start by saying that the six or seven billion dollar figure actually sends one message that we have not yet fully tapped the potential of this relationship. And I know from our point of view, from the Indian point of view, we are particularly keen. There are set, several areas which we want to look at where Canada uh, is an already an important source of primary product produced to India, including uranium, potash, bituminous coal, India's exports of pharmaceuticals, steel, IT services. We look at Canada as a major energy uh, provider. And as the Indian economy has, um, you know, is opening up, taking advantage of the uh, COVID, and I'll get, have an opportunity later during the interaction uh, phase of this discussion uh, this morning or evening, depending on where you are, I'll have an opportunity to tell you what exactly has been happening in the uh, uh, during the COVID period here. But uh, we draw great uh, uh, strength from the people to people relations. We have 1.6 million Canadians of Indian heritage and almost 700,000 Indians living in Canada, including 230,000 students. Um, when Prime Minister Trudeau came here, I had the feeling that he had uh, more Sikhs in his cabinet uh, and I was somehow in a minority uh, in terms of turban people in my uh, 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 council of ministers. Of course, many of my other colleagues who are not Sikhs also wear turbans, but I think you guys are doing pretty well even on, on that score, uh, etc. And I must tell you that as a Punjabi, uh, when I hear about the, uh, you know, uh, dhabas along the Trans-Canada Highway, I mean, there's something in me which, uh, you know, warms up to that. Uh, so I'm, I'm saying this in a lighter vein. But looking at Canada-India relations, I mean, no matter which part of the uh, assignments which have been entrusted to me, civil aviation, uh, uh, Minister Eng was very kind. She talked about our Vande Bharat flights. But let me tell you, uh, we are already the world's third largest domestic civil aviation market. And uh, we have opened up domestic civil aviation after the very severe lockdown. We are already at 50% of the capacity in, tra in, in uh, passenger traffic. Our cargo capacity has reached 65. And by the time we celebrate Diwali in India, which is mid-November, between Diwali and the end of the year, I think we'll get 100% of our pre-COVID uh, traffic back which is, um, you know, 300,000 passengers in a day uh, handled by our 109 airports. When I look at India, Canada, India, the United States, etc., I have always been a great votary of encouraging the civil aviation carriers of both the United States and Canada to mount more flights. Because if you look at the numbers of Indians or people of Indian uh, descent or Indian citizen or students there, there's a lot of traffic there. It's better that airlines in Canada and India uh, uh, ply on these routes directly rather than you have carriers of, uh, uh, from other countries exercising six freedom rights. Now, when you come to my other responsibility, which is the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs, uh, I, I sometimes lose um, you know, uh, perspective on figures. But we are, man, we are now producing, what, seven to nine million 
square meters of urban space. 600 to 800. No, 600. No, no. 600 to 800 million square meters. 600 to 800 million square meters of urban uh, space every year, which according to a McKenzie study is uh, the equivalent of one Chicago that is being built every year in India between now and 2030. Now, I know those figures sound a little startling, but they're true. And if you look at our airport privatization program, uh, Canadian entities have participated in the past. Canadian business uh, people have participated. So for all the three ministries that I have um, responsibility for, or I'm associated with my colleague, Mr. Goel, um, I can tell you the potential is immense. All that we need to do is from the governments. I don't think governments should be trading, as I've always believed. We just have to bring our economic entities in touch. We need to provide the ecosystem which facilitates enhancement of trade in goods and services. I was very impressed with the figure you gave, uh, Minister, about 65% uh, of your GDP coming from trade. And sometimes when you look at the Indian um, um, uh, program of Atma Nirbhar, or that is a new self-reliant, resilient India, I think our friends outside sometimes perhaps overlook the fact that out of our $2.89 trillion uh, GDP prior to COVID, 50% is the external sector. So we are not as high as 65, but we are at, as, at, you know, pretty high also at 50%, which means the value of goods and uh, services exported and imported, the value of remittances, etc. And we are today, I think, embarking on uh, policies which will take us from being a $2.89 trillion economy prior to COVID to a $5 trillion economy in 2024-25 and a $10 trillion economy by 2030. And I think the room for Indo-Canadian joint effort in this area is something that we truly have not been able to uh, tap. And I'm sure between Mr. Goyal, my senior colleague on the commerce and industry side, and you, Minister Eng, uh, we'll be doing that. I just have two or three suggestions. There are many institutional mechanisms which are already in place. Uh, we have an India-Canada annual ministerial dialogue. So I was very happy that you and Minister Goyal have already interacted four times in the last five months. We have an India-Canada trade policy consultation group, which was set up in 2003, if I'm not mistaken. But I'm afraid that has not been as active as it should have been. I believe the last meeting was in 2010. And I will encourage our Commerce Secretary, or what you would call the Deputy Minister, to work that mechanism. And then we have what is called the India-Canada CEOs Forum. Again, this was set up in 2013. And I think we would be doing ourselves a great service, both sides, if we were to get the leading business um, entities or few people who can spare the time. And I think what businessmen can achieve through interaction at their level in a few hours uh, and with, uh, with us providing a helpful ecosystem in the background, we'll, uh, we'll take this uh, to a, provide a quantum high. Let me also say that in terms of objectives, I think we should be looking at some first steps and early harvest, uh, something that we can have um, look at market access issues. Uh, we can look at rules of origin, customs procedures, etc. That early harvest could then be a stepping stone in the direction of a comprehensive SEPA uh, uh, or a free trade agreement. And then we should also look at, from our point of view, the movement of natural persons, what you call uh, mode four for IT professionals, et cetera. And we'd be happy then also look at foreign investment promotion and protection agreement, where I'm sure you would be wanting to deal with some of the things which have been prominently on the Canadian uh, wish list, both in uh, bilateral and multilateral, which, which I spent the greater part of my life dealing with. We'd be happy to look at those as well. May I conclude this uh, portion? Thank you very much. Uh, and again, as I said, uh, I hope that our interaction and the um, platform that the India, Canada, Indo-Canada Chamber of Commerce are providing will be an important opportunity for us to discuss uh, steps which will help shape the post-COVID environment in which both our countries 
are so heavily invested. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Puri. Uh, your overall assessment and scope uh, for the future are definitely enlightening and encouraging. I would say, and you mentioned uh, quite a few steps that can be uh, worked on. So we look forward to that. Uh, Honorable ministers, with your permission, uh, I would like to now conduct a brief interactive uh, session. And uh, I would like to begin with Mr. Ng. When we talk about international trade, I think the first thing that uh, would happen uh, would have to happen is the small businesses have to grow and thrive in their own domestic environment. So now looking at the backdrop of COVID-19, so what I would like you to uh, you know, throw some light on how has your government supported the businesses and the economy throughout the COVID-19 pandemic? And what role, in your opinion, the trade play uh, in helping small business grow and thrive? Ministry. I, I think you're on mute, uh, Minister. Oh. Okay, yes. there we go. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for uh, that good question. And uh, and I want to thank my colleague and Mr. Puri. Uh, uh, there's not very much you said that I don't agree with. So this is uh, this is a terrific start. I mean, um, and uh, and and I saw when you sort of you know, I, I saw Goldie's head nod when you said we need to get a council of you know of uh, of, of CEOs from both countries together so that they can you know so that they can uh, essentially. In both countries. So, um, so I know we'll have an opportunity to talk about that a little further in the questions. I don't want to. I don't want to skew uh, Pramod's question here. I want to answer his question because uh, I know that there are many small businesses and small and medium-sized businesses. Um, just to give people a frame of reference uh, in Canada, I mean, um, we have like 98% of our businesses in the country are small businesses. When you say small and medium, it's 99%. So they're quite significant to Canada's economy, and um, and helping our small businesses grow domestically but also that growth into the international marketplace is absolutely crucial because I'll give you another number only 12% of our businesses are exporting so we could far do a much much better job and of that 12% it's destined to you know a very large an important market and it will always be an important market but it but uh, but it, it it's sort of north and south here in North America um, and yet there are should be should be able to help our small businesses grow. The pandemic has been particularly difficult uh, for small businesses in particular. So the government of Canada, right from the very beginning, has been steadfast at you know at the very beginning to make sure that uh, that we were tackling COVID nineteen. Our businesses really made a big sacrifice because they've had to shut down in order for us to uh, to deal with the pandemic and to flatten the curve here in Canada. I think overall um, we have done a good job, and we need to not lose the progress there. So measures like, um, you know, measures like helping uh, businesses pay for their, you know, subs like uh, uh, help them with their cost of labor. You know, their staff is really important. Helping with their fixed costs because we know that their revenues aren't coming back at 100%, but their fixed costs are. So helping with things like commercial rent and making sure that there's like some working capital, especially for those small businesses. So small business loans, some portion is forgivable and so forth. So we're going to have to keep doing that kind of work to make sure that we are businesses, uh, bridging them through this period. But your point there, and I think the real question is, how do we get businesses growing? And how do we get them growing into an international market? How do we help them to cross the the the, 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 the Atlantic Ocean? I mean, um, into, you know, into great markets like India. So this is where, and, uh, you know, Pramod, you will know this very, uh, very well, because, you know, Canada has a program called Can Export, and uh, the Canada Indo uh, Chamber of Business is, uh, you know, is, uh, you know, is a recipient of that good work. And what is it? It actually is creating that foundation and that continued work to help our businesses develop the capability, the skills to actually also go abroad. Um, we know that we're not going to be able to go abroad in the same way because of travel restrictions and so forth, because everyone is still uh, quite uh, concerned about the spread of the virus. But you know, but the program is actually pivoting so that it's enabling you to do businesses, uh, even with, you know, even if we're not able to travel, but to continue to let businesses of prospecting for business and continuing to develop that capability. So we need to keep uh, we need to keep doing that work, doubling down to support our businesses. And um, and, you know, and to what Minister Perry said earlier, um, 
three quarters of our, I mean, yes, we have made in Canada strategy as well so that we are protecting um, our resilient supply chain in the context of COVID-19. But, you know, um, we do trade our businesses and our, whether it's merchandise or, you know, or in people or in, uh, in, in IT, et cetera, they cross borders. They must continue to do that. That's how we do business. So, um, so making sure that 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 turning inwards and that that and, and that you resist against that and that we all do because it's not just can't we all have to do this which is why it's so important that we work uh, across uh you know across with our international partners and this is where you know at the g20 we've worked together not um, that we don't um that we don't have these barriers up and that we continue to facilitate trade uh but in canada creating that domestic capacity for our small businesses to grow and to take and be brave to grow uh, into those international markets is key and working with the Indo-Canada Chamber of Commerce and uh, is 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 absolutely a critical part to that. Thank you, Minister Ng, for that uh, extremely important information. Uh, now, Minister Puri, uh, my question to you, uh, the Indian economy currently uh, seems in a bit of paradoxical situation. And when I say that, uh, I'm looking at some of the information, like in May, the government announced uh, a $266 billion economic package to tackle the anticipated slump in the economy because of the pandemic. In July, India also attracted about $20 billion worth of FDI. And then last week, uh, India's uh, foreign exchange reserves surged to a record high of about in excess of 541 billion. The Indian economy is evidently flourishing. It's absolutely no question. But then on the flip side, we also noticed that the GDP in the last quarter recorded, you know, uh, a negative uh, 23 plus point. And now uh, we also see India is unfortunately kind of uh, in the direction of assuming the position of a global coronavirus hotspot. So how this does this all tie up? Uh, can you Mr. share some Goyal, perspective? Mr. Goyal, it's a simple, it's a very simple answer that I can give you. And um, I said this in parliament, I've said this on with um, extended interviews with the major TV anchors, this figure of 23.9% contraction that is being mentioned is the figure for the first quarter. And the first quarter of our financial year is April, May, June. On 23rd March, the prime minister and the government ordered a complete lockdown, which was comprehensive. Therefore, from 23rd March to about the end of May, there was economic activity in all segments came virtually to a grinding halt. Now, these figures are two months old. I mean, these figures came out uh, about 10 days or a, or, or a fortnight ago, and they're the figures up to, as I said, April, May, June. Now, when there's no economic activity, I think those who are my, my friends in the political opposition, and today I had one of my colleagues uh, speaking on the uh, government benches, telling them that this was actually not bad news. Except they didn't know how to read the figures. Now, let me tell you what we have done during the uh, uh, lockdown period. We have, of um, April, I think, we have fed something like 800 million people which is a program which started in April and will run to November at the cost of US dollars 20 billion. You see, we are a, in, in global terms, we are a large economy, but we have developmental challenges in the sense that we have low per capita incomes. So the most vulnerable segments of our society, 800 million people have been fed, are going to be fed, they started in April, will continue, continue till uh, November. To take care of the most vulnerable sections we allotted us dollars 5.3 billion as additional funding for rural employment guarantee scheme from the original outlay of 8 billion dollars so 8 billion dollars plus 5.3 billion dollars let me explain what happened you know 
the coronavirus which came from outside our borders the the people who were working in manufacturing and elsewhere in the urban areas decided because of the fear that had been spread because of the you know uh, i would say the exaggerated uh, uh, view on what the consequences would be to their life they went from the urban areas back to their homes in the rural areas so we infused that uh, uh, money into the rural economy so that they could get employment in rural area but now they're all coming back now let me give you a few statistics the our gst collections gst is um, goods and services tax in the month of august 2020 is 92% of what it was for august 2019 so there's only 8% contraction <clears throat> i could give you several figures delhi metro was closed when we locked down it opened on 7th of september and when it opened on 7th of september we started with a modest people were hesitant to travel etc started with the first day's figure in delhi was 15000 we have yesterday i don't have the figures for uh, today yesterday we had already reached over nearly 2 million people were traveling so economic activity was down because of the lockdown it's now not picking up gradually but i'm worried because if the metro delhi metro which is 389 kilometers out of the 700 kilometers uh, indian metro if it comes back to the 6.5 million passengers we had per day which is the highest figure pre covid then i'm getting worried whether my sops and the social distancing and all those other procedures will be valid so i was telling the executive head of delhi metro look when you reach 10 lakhs or you know 1 hmm? million. million sorry we, we yesterday we were short of 1 million when when you reach 1 million start very carefully examining your sops seeing if they can take the strain uh, minister you mentioned bombardier look i'm also the minister responsible uh, for civil aviation and uh, uh, urban transport so i'm very familiar with the uh, bombardier and the fantastic role they are playing now as an indian company etc here and and contributing i believe many of these entities i don't have the figures of they are not only manufacturing here they are exporting to uh, australia uh, etc so this is what it is all about so let me tell you we put in 1.4 r rupees 1.4 trillion national infrastructure pipeline consists of 6835 projects across sectors such as energy social and commercial infrastructure communication water and sanitation we have a robust plan there to take this to a 5 trillion dollar economy and from there to a 10 trillion dollar economy so the fact that these figures were 23.9% uh, contraction is a figure you can easily explain but it's also true that last week our foreign exchange reserve surged to 541 point in july i don't have the figure for august or september but believe me from what i can see uh, in the ministries i'm dealing with there is interest in india and i uh, invite canadian companies to take advantage of the opportunity for us to work together thank you uh, mr puri and of course i mean we at the chamber are also looking forward to uh, add to that moment and thanks for sharing uh, that perspective uh ministering uh when we talk about covid and of course there would be a post pandemic situation so in the post pandemic economy canada is gearing up to expand its reach across emerging economies and of course india can emerge as one of the canada's major trade partners so what specific measures need to be undertaken to enhance the economic and trade collaboration between canada and india yeah that's a that's a very very good question and uh and uh pramod i just uh you know i i want to um you know um apologize in advance i know we had a number of questions and uh and my staff keep you know pinging me here on the other side to 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 say make your question make your answer quick 
picking up on the times that you you know you're giving your colleague plenty of time to speak as well so but uh but i uh i'm gonna ref reference what minister Perry said a little earlier um i am looking forward to having a uh a uh a, a, a ministerial dialogue with uh with uh with my colleague with minister Goyal. um we are getting ready to do that uh we have had uh, some very constructive and good uh, discussions and i think that uh, there is certainly a commitment on both of our sides to tr you know to create that environment uh, to enable our businesses to do business so i think that that's absolutely true um and uh, and i'm looking forward to uh, to having that ministerial dialogue as soon as it is practical uh, to do so i think that uh, the trade policy consultation uh, thank you minister per i think that's a that's a terrific uh, that's a terrific idea and i know that our uh, you know our civil servants um uh, you know they have been in touch and they've been in touch with and I have spent the time together and uh and 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 making sure that we 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 have those uh you know we need to do work at the ministerial level but we also need the department to department to actually you know to 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 do uh you know to do the necessary preparation like legwork and you know they're the ones that actually carry out a lot of uh of of the design and uh you know and and, and work and I do really like the uh uh the suggestion I couldn't agree with uh, minister Puri uh more which is that uh, that uh, the job for us is to create the right environment for businesses to do business. And uh, it's not governments that do business, it's business that does business. So creating the right environments for businesses to do that, um, uh, you know, Goldie is here and uh, and he and I uh, connect often. And uh, this is about the small businesses, but it is also about, uh, you know, significant investments and also our, our large or, you know, our large have the opportunities to be able to build uh, that uh, you know th those commercial relationships and those commercial uh, conditions and and you know and, and and what do governments need to do? Governments need to be able to work on issues like um, market access, like um, you know like uh, you know customs procedures and feel like those like you know we've got to make sure we get the mechanisms right and 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 being able to work towards a you know a uh, a foreign investment protection agreement so that the so that the rules the rules of engagement are clear for businesses on on all sides so we create the conditions the predictability the frameworks that are necessary to enable our businesses and our investments to do that um even without those things i have to say like you heard me say the numbers earlier about you know about uh, about uh, canadian investment in india and 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 how robust and how significant it is um the work that that requires building i mean building that capacity for our smes to take advantage i mean i when i think about i don't know uh almost probably i don't know it must be about 10 years right i mean um uh, I see Ravi's here as well. Sitapathy. I mean, you know, he'll remember the good work that uh, that you know that uh, I was doing with uh, with colleagues uh, at the time, where you know where we partnered between Canada and India uh, through the Mumbai Stock Exchange on you know on a bridge for uh, for startups between the two countries. So there is like so so there's much to build. Like there is much to build on, um, and I think that that work just uh, needs to uh, to continue, um, and it's going to require it's going to require. Uh, 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 sustained engagement and commitment at the political level, uh, of course, are, you know, our, our, our bureaucracies. I mean, you know, Canada, uh, it, it, it is terrific to be able to collaborate with India. I mean, as two democracies, I mean, who, who, who respect and, and, uh, and, and, you know, the rule of law and, uh, and, that is founded on, uh, you know, on 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 a rules based system that we agree to and then we adhere to. So uh, so that's that's the work ahead. And uh, and I'm excited to to uh, to to do that. And um, and, and 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 there's no reason that we shouldn't and that we can't be doing it. We should. Thank you, Minister. And we at the chamber also hope to see all this come to fruition uh, soon. Uh, Minister Puri. Uh, the trade, uh, tourism, and technology this is, see, have become the new triad for India under the Atnirbhar Bharat program that you mentioned uh, earlier in your opening remarks. The focus is to promote India's image as an alternate and reliable low-cost manufacturing destination in the post-pandemic scenario as companies uh, seek to de-risk the manufacturing value chains from over-dependence on a single location. 
So how does this goal uh, is going to be reflected in India's foreign trade policy? Sorry, I think, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Can, you, can you hear me? Yeah, this is good now, yes. Yeah, uh, thank you, Pramoji. I can be very direct and upfront. First of all, there is no change whatsoever in our trade policy per se, overall change. What we are looking at is a new situation which has come about, not of our making, but which has resulted from the fact that we are facing an unprecedented situation. I mean, we've dealt with viruses in the past. We've dealt with Ebola when I was ambassador to the uh, United Nations and WHO, H1N1, SARS, etc. You know, SARS had a mortality rate of 17%, uh, but we, we took it in our stride. The current virus has produced an unprecedented situation and, and is in many uh, respects sui generis. I mean, it looks like something like what happened in 100 years ago in the case of the Spanish flu. But we have realized suddenly that when the SARS, when, when the COVID-19 uh, pandemic broke out, we did not manufacture PPEs. We did not manufacture uh, ventilators, um, other medical equipment. And we also realized that we were Again, maybe not a conscious decision. We had become extremely dependent on one particular supply chain. So from not manufacturing any of this medical equipment, now we are manufacturing on a scale which is supplying to other countries. And that is true also. We became, in many respects, the pharmacy of the world. Uh, you know, many, many years ago when uh, we, we went down the road on manufacturing generics and so on. But we have now looked at it very differently and we scaled up. So from testing labs to PPEs to the figures are astronomical. And much of this, I can tell you during the COVID period, we imported 1500 tons of medical equipment and essential supplies. We distributed a thousand tons within the country and sent lots of this material to other countries, hydroxychloroquine, paracetamol, and I can go on naming it. Look, Atma Nirbharta is about the changed situation. Now we have this, uh, you know, uh, diversification of uh, supply um, chains uh, with countries like Australia, with Japan. Uh, we're very happy to look at this with other countries. The idea is to prepare ourselves for a post-COVID world. We are not going to be inward looking. In fact, we are becoming more resilient and more in a position to become part of the global supply chain. I would not want to use words like alternate or reliable low cost manufacturing destination. You know, the marketplace works that out. There are things we can do. We have we have uh, both the educated, skilled people. We have a demographic advantage advantage. How do we utilize those assets to deal with a new emerging situation which is there in the world? This is what is about now, for instance, we have many cases I, I can give you seven we have taken policy measures we have ab abolished a dividend distribution tax we've incre um, increased the foreign portfolio investors limit we have given tax exemption for sovereign wealth fund and pension fund we have amended the companies to act to decriminalize more offenses under the act those are things which are doing which somehow don't get the attention that you know uh, one way to say is well india like many countries uh, is beginning to look at India first. Hey, wait a minute. We should be looking at the health and citizens, uh, you know, welfare. I was very happy when uh, Minister Eng said earlier in our first introduction that you are committed to the welfare, to the health of your citizens, to their well-being. Even the WTO and its predecessor instrument, the GATT, General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, the preamble of that is the objective is to raise the standard of living by entering into mutually beneficial trading arrangements with them. And that is the continuing philosophy, except that we suddenly realized when COVID broke out, uh, Pramoji, that we were very vulnerable. There are some things we were not manufacturing at all. I mean, and those who are not, it doesn't require rocket science to realize, you know, some of the industries which are 
registering phenomenal rates of growth in India are some of these that I'm mentioning. You know, sanitizers, you know, uh, uh, you know, ventilators, uh, manufacture of PPs. This is a new, it's a reflection of the times we are in. But as I said, we are doing this as part of the Atman Hirbarta spirit, which is both about being more self-reliant, being more productive members, in getting our manufacturing uh, sector going and being able to contribute to the shape of the pre post covid global economy thank you minister Pude. Uh, i don't know if minister ing uh, is still there or she dropped out i i don't see her but again i mean uh, ms puri i mean continuing with what you said the uh, if we look at the statistical analysis of the two way merchandise trade between canada and india that reveals the Canada's, Canada's traditional merchandise exports to India and imports from India continue to stagnate, even though there is a significant uh, growth in the export and import of these merchandises, products from or to other parts of the world. So, which definitely indicates that there is ample scope of increasing the two-way trade, even in the traditional merchandise uh, between Canada and India in future, in months to come, years to come. Uh, just briefly, uh, what can be done to promote and enhance traditional merchandise trade? And if there is anything uh, that uh, facilitator organizations like our chamber can play a role on? Any comments from you, uh, Minister Pooh? Uh, Pramoji, I can say that I agree with you. I think I'd already foreshadowed what we can do uh, in my uh, uh, opening um, comments. I think you have ministerial level uh, interaction between ministers Eng and Goel. That's one. It should be backed up by the trade policy interaction between our deputy ministers, and it should be supplemented by uh, the CEOs forum. I think once you've got these three mechanisms, uh, you have them in place. You need to make them functional, and you need to assign a regular periodicity. I think COVID has provided that thing I've done now, this is the second interaction I'm doing with Canadian economic entities, uh, I think this month. Uh, the, the other one was on my own, independent, and I found that very useful. I have suggested to some of your pension funds that there are projects in which they could fruitfully uh, explore, like providing last mile financing to some of our stalled projects. And I said, look, you've got all the collateral, all the uh, 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 insurance which is available there. So I can come up with a number of things, but I think the correct answer to your um, question is these three mechanisms, the ministerial interaction between the two uh, ministers responsible, trade policy at deputy minister level, and the CEO's forum. And I would happily send you thereafter what we are doing in terms of the 24 subsectors which we have identified, electronics, high technology, what we are doing in other areas, pharmaceuticals, and what we are doing in terms of FDI reforms, uh, defense sector FDI increased to 74%, uh, aviation route rationalization, all those details I'll send you as we go along. Thank you. Thank you. Definitely, uh, Minister Puri, we'll follow up and uh, keep the momentum going. And uh, uh, in, in the interest of time, I think we're still a little behind already. So I will have to conclude this session of our introduction. Uh, on behalf of our chamber, its members, stakeholders, and sponsors, I would like to thank uh, both the ministers for finding the time from their busy schedule to participate in today's program. And uh, we look forward to more such engagements in the coming future. Uh, thank you all. And I now invite uh, IEEE's Vice President responsible for international trade and IT, Vijay Thomas, to introduce the second session. Vijay. Yeah. Yeah. Th thank you very much, uh, Pramoji. Um, and thank you very much uh, to the both the ministers. I think that was a fantastic discussion. Um, I think there's, uh, there's a lot of you know food for discussion for the next session. And and today uh, we have with our midst, in our midst, you know, two, uh, you know, we had both the ministers, we also have the Indian High Commissioner to Canada and the Canadian High Commissioner to 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 India. So this is something that is is unprecedented. We we've got a whole huge.
plethora of celebrity in, in the Indo-Canada corridor available today. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our uh, uh, session, you know, we will, we'll, what are we going to have today? Uh, we're, we're going to have two sessions. Uh, we'll have to, we'll have, um, you know, what the ministers talked about is a high level vision of what they see over the next five years, uh, 2025. Um, but it, this has to be also implemented. I think promote the G, uh, you know, uh, looked at it and then said that they, we, we've got to, um, you know, implement this. So we would like to hear from the starting off, uh, can we have the slide, please? Okay. So, so the second session, we will have a special address uh, from uh, Ajay Biseria, uh, the High Commissioner of Canada to India, uh, and from Nadir Patel, uh, the High Commissioner of Canada to um, India. And, and then we will look at the panelists that we have here, Goldie Hyder, Vikram Kurana, Mohit Singla, and Rupa Naik. And our, our um, uh, moderator for, for that session is going to be Ravi Sitapati, a former uh, uh, IEEE okay. president. And, and what we will be looking at there is um, looking at what we've been working on until now, um, and 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 the discussions that the ministers had, we will be we will be talking about how what the ministers talked about, how can we implement this over the next five years, and and how can that be actually put to put to 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 um, put to put to put to actually take into fruition. So I see uh, Mr. Bisaria um, uh, on here as well. So I'd like to first introduce um, Mr. Ajay Bisaria. Okay, let's start with me. I, that's me. That's my Vijay Thomas. I'm the president of there of the I C as well as I am the CEO of Tangentia. Let's let's moving on to to Ajay Bisaria. Um, His Excellency Ajay Bisaria started off uh, in as the High Commissioner of India to Canada. On May on uh, March first, twenty twenty, and um, you know he couldn't have found a better time to join, and 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 I think it was just immediately after which that we had COVID hit in. Uh, so, but he's not a stranger to 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 uh, you know difficult situations. Uh, Mr. Ajay Bisaria before this was the India's High Commissioner to Pakistan. Um, you know, until that uh, that uh, office got big, uh, you know, downgraded. He was also India's High Commissioner to Poland, and um, he was also the Private Secretary to the Prime Minister of India, uh, Atal Bihari Vajpayee, for for a long period. So he's been in the corridors of power. He understands, um, you know, how things can be implemented. And I had the good fortune of meeting Mr. Basaria uh, last week uh, in Toronto uh, on his vis first visit from Ottawa to Toronto. So we at the IEEE are, are really excited to have Mr. Basaria as the High Commissioner of India to Canada, and we look forward to working with you. So over to you, sir, and we'd like to hear your views on what we just heard from the ministers and the, the, the road to 2025 uh, and how we're going to be going on this road and, and your, your views on it. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you for that introduction and uh, good morning, good evening to, to everyone, uh, depending on where you are. Uh, sir, it's, it's a little light. If you can speak a little louder, sir. Okay, so we'll, uh, is it better now? Is it? Uh, no, no, a little more loud. Okay, so we'll just, uh, Maybe you could uh, just go on to another uh, speaker and I will come back with my, uh, you know, we'll try to replug everything here. It, it is very light. Okay. So, uh, yeah, this is better. Replug it. Uh, we could go, uh, I was requesting you to go to another speaker and we'll come back after uh, just okay. rebooting us. So, thank you. So, I think. We will, we will, uh, thank you, sir. Um, um, I will, we will move to the next speaker. Um, next speaker, I think, is, is somebody that if you've done business in the Indo business, Indo Canada corridor, um, 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 Mr. Nadir Patel is the, um, Canadian, the Canadian High Commissioner to India. Um, His Excellency Nadir Patel, um, you know, those of you who've had the fortune of being on an Indo Canada trade mission, uh, the highlight of the indo canadian trade mission um, sir and if nobody's told you that is usually dinner at your residence 
So if that's not been told to you as yet, um, let's make that official. Everybody at the Indo-Canadian Chamber of Commerce, if we go on a mission to India, it is, is there dinner at Nadir Patel's house is, is something that we usually do look up to. So, so you know, besides that, you know, uh, uh, Mr. Nadir Patel has been um, in the, in the, in the, uh, you know, in the foreign service for, for quite some time. He has been, before this, he was in China. He's also started his career with the CRA. So, so uh, Mr. Nadir Patel, uh, we, I think you're well known to everybody in this Indo-Canada corridor. Uh, and I think, um, you know, we would like to hear from you and we'll go back to uh, Mr. Basaria. So over to you, um, Mr. Patel. Well, thank you very much um, uh, for that introduction. And uh, once again, it's uh, it's such a privilege and a pleasure to be here with uh, ICCC uh, and uh, a number of distinguished uh, speakers as well. Let me start off by acknowledging uh, my counterpart, uh, His Excellency Ajay Bisaria, High Commissioner. Uh, it's always great and share some insights together at uh, any venue that allows us to greater uh, support and promote the Canada-India commercial relationship. Uh, and thank you for uh, now deferring to me because I'll steal your thunder and share everything that you were going to say uh, in my remarks, uh, which uh, <laughs> we, we, we go back and forth to see who's going to say what first so that the other one won't be able to repeat that. So um, let me let me uh, also thank the chamber. Um, my association with ICCC goes back well over 20 years. Um, and uh, I, I've, uh, I've had a lot of opportunity in Canada as well as here in India. Uh, to support the very important work of the chamber, support its members, and uh, and we've together come a long way. You've played a very important role in helping grow the uh, the um, the uh, commercial relationship between Canada and India. So it's really great to see you uh, continue to uh, actively engage and, and build on this momentum. Uh, and in particular, uh, uh, President uh, Goyal, uh, great work, and uh, thank you for again for, for this opportunity. Um, I'm going to uh, share just a few uh, brief introductory remarks. You heard from our Minister uh, Ng, who was uh, online here, and, uh, and there was a very good interaction between uh, ministers just a little while ago. Um, so my comments are less uh, a formal set of remarks, but more an informal set of observations, and, and just something to stimulate uh, some thought and, uh, and perhaps set up a little bit of the panel that we're going to see in a bit as well. So I, I wanted to share uh, two different perspectives. One is just uh, a few observations on the ground right now from your your representation in India, Canada's representation in India, what are we seeing, what are we hearing? And then secondly, a little bit of where we are going in terms of what we're thinking of looking ahead, uh, navigating the current situation with the pandemic, what that means for the overall relationship in terms of commerce, trade and whatnot. Uh, I'll be very brief. Um, first of all, we, uh, as Minister Ng said, you know, we, we have to celebrate our successes, look at where we've come from, look at our past, uh, success. And that's going to be very important uh, because what we're doing right now is leveraging that success, but also seeing how we can play a role uh, to salvage or ensure that that success and that momentum continues through a very difficult set of circumstances, not only here in India, but in Canada and elsewhere around the world. And let me just share a little bit more on that. We, uh, over the last several years, the last five years in particular, each year the commercial relationship, trade and investment both ways, has hit record numbers. Every single metric across the board that you can measure uh, on the trading relationship has uh, hit record numbers each year of the last five years. So we've come from uh, a very robust set of success successes. Uh, the momentum was very strong coming into 2020. Uh, and then all of a sudden, the, uh, the pandemic uh, hits around the world. And um, so I think it's really important for us to know that the base that we've built uh, over the last few years is something that gives us strength to navigate the challenges. Um, on that note, um, there has never been a time like now for countries to come together and work together and collaborate uh, to navigate through the pandemic, get on the other side. Um, you know, I think uh, Canada and India can do more together than they can individually. We can become self-reliant without being protectionist. And a way to become self-reliant is by working together. And we're seeing that between the Canada and India, the Canadian and Indian government right now. I would argue that the level of cooperation 
and connectivity is at its strongest point that I've seen in a very, very long time. Uh, you just heard Minister Ng, Minister Puri, uh, Minister Ng and her counterpart, Minister Goyal, have spoken on the phone a number of times in the last uh, few months. Our prime ministers have spoken twice on the phone since the pandemic began. Our foreign ministers are in regular contact by telephone call and another means as well. Minister Jay Shankar was in Canada at the end of December, and that really set the stage for a level of engagement that uh, has really taken off. Um, and we're seeing across the board every single um, dialogue, initiative, uh, joint working group that Canada and India have, have uh, reignited, if you will, uh, thanks in part to the leadership of High Commissioner Bissaria. Uh, but we're very keen to continue building on this momentum, and India is very keen to build on the momentum. And as I said, there's never been a more important time for that momentum to continue. That's what's happening right now. Um, there's a lot of engagement, a lot of uh, discussion on a number of fronts, uh, and, uh, and we're looking to build on that well into, into the future. Um, what's also happening right now is um, we, we very much are focused on taking stock of the successes of the last five years or so and looking at you know the the magnitude of the commercial relationship whether it's companies trading collaborative efforts joint ventures whatever it might be or investment you know we want to we, we want to take stock of that and ensure that it succeeds through a very difficult situation with respect to the pandemic um, and that's indian companies in canada canadian companies here investors both ways um, you know, right now, the name of the game is surviving before we can thrive again. And I think that's going to be really, really important. Um, and so what are we doing on that note? We're, we're trying to inform ourselves of where do things stand in terms of uh, companies, in terms of challenges on the ground, what challenges has have COVID brought to the table, and what is it that we can do as high commissioners, as diplomats, as, as governments to help support, facilitate, it could be policy changes, it could be uh, navigating new relationships, looking at building on the success. So we're looking at doing, uh, gaining as much information and, and, and sharing as much uh, as we can in terms of what we can offer. Um, and, and I think that is a, a, a very, very important uh, set of, uh, of initiatives. What we're also seeing right now is, you know, the challenges that uh, are being faced in India, in Canada, and around the world. Um, you know, the, uh, there's no near-term end in sight, but we also don't believe that they're long-term. And when you look at Canadian investors or Canadian companies coming into India, for years, one of the main things that we've been saying to them is, you must have a long-term outlook on India. If you're here for a short-term turn around or you're just, you know, want, to, want a, a quick transaction, it's not your market. You've got to be here for the long haul. So um, it's challenging. It's going to be challenging navigating through the current situation. Um, but if, if you stick to that long-term horizon that you had already coming in, I think there are ways for us to see how you can navigate this storm. And, and that leads me to my, my final comment on, the, on, on this sort of what we're observing right now is, um, as I said, for those five, six years that I've been here, we've always talked about long-term, keep an eye on the long ball, and it's always been our own strategic thinking and our planning has been for the long haul. For the first time, we're now thinking short-term. You know, And I always used to say short-termism is not a good thing. We really need to go beyond the medium and into the long-term. But right now, I would actually say that short-term thinking is actually not a bad thing. You know, so, so how do you navigate the next 12 months, 12 to 18 months, you know, um, the end, uh, getting to the other side of the pandemic is, 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 is difficult to project or predict, but there will be an end. Um, how that happens is still to be determined. Uh, so we need to think more in the short term than we ever have before. And I think that's going to be important. Shifting gears uh, slightly to where we're, what, what, where we're focused our efforts on going forward, looking ahead for us right now. There's just a few things I wanted to share. One is um, we are revisiting what we do as trade commissioners and diplomats here in terms of supporting Canadian companies. Um, what, what, what may have been important a year ago or two years ago, uh, you, you know, business development efforts, uh, building on momentum of existing investors here, 
uh, trade fairs and exhibits and seminars, whatever, um, may not be relevant or important today in that short-term frame that I just touched on. Uh, now it's a bit more of where do we pro reprioritize our efforts? Uh, it, it has to be to support the initiatives that have already taken place, the investors, the companies that are here, and ensure that we can do whatever we can for them. It's also about exploring new sectors that have greater potential than we thought they may have had before. Healthcare is a great example. The extensive interaction between Canada and India in the last few months is a result of COVID, vaccine-related collaboration, uh, the pharmaceutical uh, supply chain, uh, among others, uh, has really brought to the forefront. There's been a lot happening over the years on uh, medical devices, medical technology, looking at uh, infrastructure development in the healthcare ecosystem. But COVID has brought this to the forefront, and perhaps uh, there are opportunities there that we need to leverage now, uh, because not only will it further develop or deepen our trading relationship, but in fact, it can also help navigate the immediate pandemic in Canada, in India, or better yet, around the world as well. So we're looking at what new sectors, and Minister Ng talked about energy, agriculture, she talked about uh, water and transportation. Um, and these are traditional sectors that we'll continue to focus on and support, but our growth, our efforts around new initiatives, we believe are better served if they're tied to helping Indian and Canadian companies come out of the pandemic. And I think that's gonna be a really important shift for us for the next, uh, year or two going forward. Uh, the second thing on this looking ahead that I, I wanted to touch on is um, something that we're seeing, but that I think is fantastic and has potential for us to support more. And that is um, organizations like ICCC, like the Business Council of Canada, I see Goldie Hyders on and, uh, and, and others, um, are doing some great initiatives, seminars, webinars, uh, writing uh, briefings around what more we can do Canada, India. And there are other organizations, other chambers of commerce in India, FICI, CII, in Canada uh, uh, as well. Um, and, and, and also outside of the business uh, world, we have think tanks, we have track two dialogues happening between the McDonald Laurier Institute and ORF here. We've got Gateway House and CG with a track one and a half dialogue. And a lot of these things are coming forward without us prompting, as in the high commissions. Um, you know, Fiki is looking at something, Asocham is looking at something here, uh, a dialogue, and what you're doing today, I think, is really groundbreaking stuff as well. So we're, we're, we want to now use these organizations in, in a constructive way, show our support, which is why I'm convinced that both Ajay and myself are here, among other reasons, and, and, and amplify your efforts because you amplify our efforts to grow the commercial relationship. So, so, you know, we want to essentially look at this as a team effort of organizations, business leaders, and government coming together to support and further grow the, the trading relationship. And that's we're gonna, what we're going to emphasize a lot more of our efforts on working with uh, partners on initiatives like this um, uh, going forward. Um, so let me just conclude by, uh, by, uh, by saying that um, there is some unpredictability for the next you know, year or two. And, and I think um, we are adapting and we're going to have to adapt. Um, one way that we will adapt is work closer with um, our colleagues at the Indian High Commission in Canada. Um, and, and I think um, the only way, as I said at the outset of my remarks, that we will succeed in becoming self-reliant or thriving uh, again after we survive the next year plus is by working together. And uh, the more we do that, the more we adapt, I think the greater likelihood of success. So on that note, let me just uh, thank you again and wish you uh, a very successful rest of this uh, dialogue. And I look forward to hearing uh, other speakers as well. Thank you very much, Vijay, and uh, Pramod as well. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Hi, Commissioner Nadir Patel. Uh, you know, uh, it is always a pleasure uh, listening to you. And I think, uh, you know, one thing that we, I think, heard loud and clear is, you know, look for survival, short term, you know, get through the short term, and then we're all alive for the long term. So, but obviously, we have an eye on the long term still. 
On that note, um, 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 we will go back to High Commissioner Ajay Bisaria. Sir, we're hoping your, your sounds back up. So we will not do any introduction. We've already introduced you. Uh, so over to you, sir. Okay, so let's start with the check and see if you can hear me. Yes, loud and clear. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. So uh, it's uh, wonderful to be back here and uh, it's great to follow his Excellency Nadir Patel, because I think this was a ruse. Uh, I, I let him do all the heavy lifting because we say pretty much identical things and uh, we've just come out of another uh, excellent uh, uh, webinar where we were talking about healthcare. And uh, that was the reason why I couldn't uh, join you earlier. But uh, it's always a pleasure to follow, uh, to be in a panel with uh, Nadir, but even better if I follow him because he's done all the heavy lifting. So uh, thank you ICCC for uh, uh, organizing this wonderful event. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting all of you, uh, Vijayji, Pramodji, uh, last week in Toronto, and we had a very intensive interaction and I got a sense of what you're planning to do. You got a sense of what we were planning to do. But I think it's a wonderful idea to do this of giving uh, a public platform to two ministers, uh, one from either side, because more uh, the, we are having private conversations, as Nadir said, but to give them a public uh, platform to be able to uh, speak uh, uh, to a wider audience is something wonderful because uh, uh, the ministers also then get some bit of feed feedback on uh, how uh, the whole economic corridor is shaping up and how, what people are thinking. So what I would do my job now, I think is uh, much easier is uh, simply add to uh, a few things to what uh, uh, Nadir has uh, already said. And uh, I'll have to be a little careful about not uh, repeating too many things because uh, we work for the same purpose and uh, we uh, coordinate closely and uh, we have uh, an identical approach uh, uh, to going forward. But let me start with the uh, pandemic. And really speaking, uh, this is uh, a crisis in the short term, which we have to uh, face head on. Uh, we've seen the numbers in India, uh, 5 million plus. But the good news on the numbers is that 4 million people have recovered. It's uh, the fatality rate is still well under 2%. And uh, the overall uh, infection rate in the population is under 0.4%. So what we are hoping going forward is that we peak early. We No one can predict when that's going to happen, but in the next uh, uh, two or three months. And that 2021 becomes a year of recovery where India uh, has a V-shaped recovery and India leads uh, a global recovery as a, a global engine of uh, growth. And uh, this is what some of the uh, uh, some of the international agencies are predicting. But uh, of course, it's very hard to uh, predict when uh, this process of recovery will begin. But we are seeing some positive signs in some sectors that we have reached pre-COVID levels of activity. But I think one point which is clear to India is that we are not going into another lockdown. This is. Uh, a moment where we have decided that we have to unlock smartly and we have to uh, hope for growth and we have to uh, learn to live with this virus. So I think that is the broad point uh, about the uh, pandemic, which we should understand. And uh, talking of the Indo-Canadian corridor, we just had an excellent uh, conversation on the Indo-Canadian health corridor. And let me begin by that. Uh, I had a conversation yesterday uh, with Dr. Neymar, who is the chief science uh, advisor uh, uh, to the government of Canada. And what we are essentially telling Canada is that, uh, and in fact, telling the world that India is not just the pharmacy of the world, but India is also the vaccine producer for the world. So no matter where this vaccine is going to be discussed, uh, discovered and approved, uh, there are 23 of them being uh, in various stages of animal or human trial, wherever it is discovered, the scaling up and production uh, will be done in India. And uh, this is where uh, the numbers of uh, 300 million or a billion vaccine doses uh, can be produced. And this is where the uh, economies of scale will come into operation. So we are offering to all our partners, including Canada, the 
the opportunity to have uh, uh, private sector collaborations in the health sector in, in vaccines. So I think that defines in many ways the uh, Indo-Canadian partnership, this strategic partnership. As Nadir mentioned, the two prime ministers have discussed the pandemic twice, uh, directly and once even in the, in the rubric of the G20. And the ministers, you saw Minister Ng, she has spoken to her counterpart, Minister uh, uh, Goel, multiple times, and uh, you heard her today. And uh, the two external affairs ministers have spoken. They've spoken both of the pandemic and post-pandemic times. And I think that is exactly the way it should be uh, between strategic partners. The other broad message that I get in conversations with business leaders in Canada is that we are now in a new paradigm in the relationship where we would like the economic uh, partnership to be driving the strategic partnership between the countries. And this is exactly what is happening in one particular sector where uh, business leaders have voted with their feet. It's much more than words. When uh, the Canadian funds and investment firms like uh, Fairfax and Brookfield which were at an investment level of $5 billion in 2014, are today at a level of uh, $55 odd billion dollars, uh, US dollars. And we expect uh, going by current projections and conversations with uh, the leaders that this would be $100 billion of investment in, in the next couple of years. So what better way do you uh, have of a vote of confidence in India's medium term and long term prospects of the Indian economy, because this is all patient capital, which is coming uh, primarily in five sectors, which is uh, infrastructure, logistics, uh, energy, and uh, real estate, and now even in the startup space. So these are the areas of huge promise. And I see that in your concept note, you had mentioned uh, four sunrise sectors, which were energy, infrastructure, clean tech, and education. And I would say these are the areas where uh, Canadian companies have invested. This is the area which India sees itself uh, uh, growing over the next 20 years. Uh, particularly, if you see infrastructure, it's a $1.4 trillion uh, pipeline, uh, the, uh, which is available at this point of time. And from the point of view of long-term investment investors, it is a $4.5 trillion pipeline that is going to be available uh, till uh, till the year 2040. Uh, I think uh, in this overall context, we know, of course, trade has gone up uh, uh, significantly, and we see uh, huge opportunities in trade and services both growing up. But I think the way the big picture is evolving is that uh, while Canada is becoming a huge source of uh, of financial capital and technologies, which are available in a disaggregated ways in multiple Canadian universities, for instance, India is becoming a, a very important source of quality human capital for uh, Canada. And you see this in the numbers of uh, uh, people coming into Canada, but particularly India is the largest source today of, uh, of immigrants, of, uh, of workers, of students, 230,000 students who potentially would be the future of this relationship, many of whom will settle down uh, in Canada or be in uh, important uh, strategic or technology sectors. So I think this is a, a very important new uh, paradigm in the relationship. And uh, this is the way we hope to go forward uh, trade, as you know, has uh, crossed the $10 billion mark, 23% growth in exports for India in the last five years. And uh, we are seeing a great deal of interest in the long-term future of, uh, in terms of the investment by the bigger companies. We're having conversations with Canadian companies, uh, which uh, are global, which may have invested in uh, other geographies like, uh, like China. And we are offering India as uh, a country with a hugely and uh, rapidly improving investment climate, not just at the federal level, but at the level of the states, and a welcoming investment climate, which is going to remain that way for 20 years, along with uh, rule of law, democracy, diversity, and, uh, and uh, all the things uh, that Canada is used to. 
uh, I think I would end. I'm uh, trying not to uh, repeat some of the things that Nadir said, but uh, I would end by uh, talking about IEEC and your special role. We discussed your uh, very special uh, expertise, uh, which can uh, focus also on the SMEs, which form the backbone of the conversations. The big companies take care of themselves, but the uh, the SMEs require your help, your support, and the support of IEEC. And I uh, really appreciate your initiative also of getting the professionals together, because uh, we had this conversation about getting uh, uh, the Indo-Canadian uh, community galvanized in and uh, involved in this relationship and getting newer uh, sections of this community involved. So we were talking about uh, the professionals, the IIT graduates, the IIM graduates, the chartered accountants, the doctors, the engineers, and uh, getting a newer segments of the diaspora involved in this relationship uh, to take it forward. So I think uh, we are at a very exciting point uh, in this relationship. There is a paradigm shifting uh, the economic partnership is becoming front and center to be an important part of the piece. Uh, you know that the political relationship is in, in a very healthy space uh, with uh, Modi 2.0 and Trudeau 2.0 in intense uh, conversation uh, in the pandemic and post pandemic times. So we are at a sweet spot for the economic relationship. And uh, I think uh, this is a very timely and a very interesting conversation. And I look forward to its outcomes. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, High Commissioner Ajay Biseraji. Um, again, I think as, as the Indo-Canadian Chamber of Commerce, we are more than ready to be that, um, you know, uh, um, uh, that, that uh, you know, the, the uh, the, the be, 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 be able to uh, allow this to happen, and we will we will bring all of these people together, and and um, we 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 definitely look forward to to putting all these constituents that we talked about, the professionals, and all of them together. So now moving on to the next part, I'd like to um, welcome Ravi Sitapati Ji. R Ravi Sitapati is um, a former uh, president of the Indo-Canadian Chamber of Commerce. And he's an expert advisor on the smart grid, smart cities, and energy systems. He's also a speaker and corporate director. He is the corporate director of LNT Power Systems India, as well as BioSirius. So over to you, uh, Mr. Sitapati, and um, we, from you, you have the panel available to you. So now we, we look forward to hearing what the panel has to say as well. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Vijay, uh, Council General, Mr. President, uh, High Commissioners. Uh, it's good to hear actually the ministers as well as the two council uh, commissioner, high commissioners speak. And I was actually very pleased that the realities on the ground, challenges were expressed fairly openly. I was also very pleased to hear that they were willing to look at now for the next 18 months, two years, perhaps till this pandemic is put behind us and also then continue on the path of the growth that existed. So there is an acknowledgement of today's realities uh, and, and I was uh, pleased to hear that. So in this format, we have about a half an hour and uh, I was planning to go as such. I've, I've introduced the notes to all the panelists and uh, some of them have agreed, some have not responded, but I'm assuming that's what it is. I'll introduce the four panelists and I'll give them two minutes of opening comments that they could wish to speak if they were giving a State of the Union address from their perspectives. And you will see from their bios, they come with very different perspectives uh, on policy, uh, small, medium enterprises, uh, venture capital, as well as large corporates. Uh, and so, and after that, we will see where that discussion goes, I'll moderate it. If I find that there are certain key elements that the high commissioners have mentioned is not touched upon, then I may impose a few questions, uh, which I've shared with them also, uh, and, and, and we'll take it from there. So without much ado, now let me introduce the four panelists. I'll start with uh, Ms. Rupa Naik. Uh, she has three decades of professional career with the trade organizations in India. She is the senior director of projects of the MVI, MVIRDC World Trade Center in Mumbai and has undertaken several roles in trade promotion, has facilitated state and central governments in policy formulation, has represented several issues in the trade side, and has conceptualized many trade programs and delegations for 
uh, India to other countries. I uh, had the for, uh, great uh, fortune of visiting the MDRDC, by the way, a five story structure in Cuff Parade. I've been there two times. And it's uh, it's a wonderful facility that if Chamber at some point would like to be there, and I think it's uh, wonderful to, to host it there. Uh, moving on to Mr. Mohit Singla. Mohit is the founding chairman of uh, TCPI, that is the Trade Promotions Council of India, a notified body in foreign trade policy and is approved by the Department of Commerce, Government of India. T TPCI is actually involved in international trade promotion activities, including studies on tariff and non-tariff barriers, which is the current story of the world today, anti-dumping safeguards while promoting exports of products and commodities. So we can see that, you know, the quarterbacking of international trade is perhaps where the TPCI would, would be noticed. Uh, uh, Mohit, I've heard about you from Vimal Mahindru, my good friend. He was the president of AIMA. Uh, he chairs one of our IEC sessions uh, in low voltage DC and I'm on his panel. So I've heard about you and I've had the pleasure of meeting you. Moving to the Canadian panel side, uh, Goldie, Goldie, we, uh, I've known Goldie over the years. He's a former advisory board uh, member of the Indo-Canada Chamber of Commerce. He is the president and CEO of Business Council of Canada. The council being a non-profit, non-partisan, represents business leaders in every region and sector of the country. Uh, Goldie was formerly the executive, uh, in fact, one of the leading executives of Hill and Knowlton uh, back uh, from 2001 to 18, and that's where I got to meet him in his office in Ottawa. And he has handled public affairs, general management and business development. And then from the from his personal perspective, he brings the strategic view, the government meanderings of policy. Uh, expect to hear from him, uh, you know, that kind of, and, and the big corporate vision uh, into India. Uh, last but certainly not the least, another good friend of mine is Vikram Kurana. Vikram is a former advisory board of the Indo-Canada Chamber of Commerce. He is the chair of the Toronto Business Development Center and serves as a board member of FINDEF Canada. And he's a member of the Dean's Council of Ted Rogers School of Management, Ryerson. Uh, he's a Canadian entrepreneur, experienced in business consulting, IT outsourcing, and investment into angel investments. I've known Vikram when he was on the board of the Asia Pacific Foundation uh, several years ago. And uh, I have also known him through other conversations that we have had. Uh, so he is a person who would probably be looking at 15,000 foot to the ground level, represent the earth and the favors of the small medium enterprises, and also about angel investing, the SME sector, if you will. So between Goldie and Vikram, you'll see the two layers, each one focusing hopefully on areas uh, where they see it happening. So without much uh, delay now, uh, I would like to ask each of the panelists, I'm going to start with uh, Ms. Rupa Naik, and I'll crisscross across the border. Uh, for their two-minute opening comments, and then we'll begin our discussions. So, Ms. Rupa Nayak, over to you. Well, I think uh, something that's very important right now is the tariff. We really need to negotiate on tariff so that India will be able to export more in this uh, present condition that we are in with the uh, pandemic. As Because I've seen that some of the agreements have been signed between uh, Canada, and US, and EU. So why can't we have some similar agreements with Canada, wherein our tariffs can be brought up? Look for between the two regions going. I look also at some other uh, sectors such as uh, defense, uh, innovation. Innovation is a huge sector which India is looking at, particularly in, as you said, they spoke about pharmaceuticals and uh, vaccines. So there is a lot of contract manufacturing which can be done within India, and particularly in Maharashtra, because this is the state which is very rich in agro as well as in pharma and textiles and engineering. And these are the sectors with which I'm sure India can look at with, uh, for business development and investments with Canada. I'm not looking only at exports. I'm also looking at the fact that we should look at investments. We can bring in a lot of investment into India because most more than 20 people are or you have uh, the parliament are Indian. So I'm sure it's not such a very difficult uh, task for them to bring in investors into the country. I think with this, I would like to say that I look forward to a great initiative and with the two ambassadors who have been so dynamic in whatever they've said, I'm sure we can see a huge potential and the potential that has not been explored so far really needs to be explored. With other experts that will be here, they'll be probably sharing more views. 
Thank you. I'm going to next ask Vikram Kurana to have his opening round of comments. Thank you, Ravi, and uh, thank you to Indo Canada Chamber for convening this very important dialogue. Um, if it was important in the pre COVID world, it's even more important in the uh, post pandemic world. Um, I've had the distinct pleasure of being an India practitioner and, in many instances, the Sherpa on both sides uh, to important business people, decision makers, and um, uh, seeing the awakening of the relative dormant relationship between 2007 and 2008 and its growth since. Um, just as these speakers have pointed out in the last uh, Canadian pension funds have invested about uh, $5.5 billion just in the last six months while the world's been working with the uh, pandemic. Um, and many of them are household names, um, obviously, uh, Reliance Geo Telecom Towers, um, RFC Commercial Real Estate Assets, Solar Assets, uh, Jet Airways is former commercial office. Many, many, many examples of investments that Canadians have made and continue to make that are um, going to benefit both countries. Um, obviously, there is the um, uh, players like Ivanhoe Cambridge, um, who are continuing to create very innovative uh, investment tools uh, that uh, will see commercial real estate um exposure increase in the canadian books now how is this all important to small players uh smes entrepreneurs all of this activity creates a stardust effect anytime you have a very large player going um there's many entrepreneurs that who are service providers to such organizations in in their country of origin normally for follow suit so all that said um, it'll be important for Canada and India to engage the value investors on both sides, because obviously, as COVID, you know, sadly takes a toll, uh, we want to keep the vulture investors in, and uh, there's no other better value investors in the world than Canadians, and if I may say so. So, having said that, I look forward to uh, this discussion, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, Mr. Mohit Sikla, your next place. Uh, thank you. I would uh, like to start by taking a cue from uh, Minister Puri's statement that uh, $6 billion uh, bilateral trade is something that one should be happy about in the aspect that it has been growing year on year. But at the same time, it is not, it is definitely a, a figure which is not, uh, uh, which is not commensurate to the potential between the two large nations. Uh, we feel that uh, the trade potential is much higher. While we have been interacting with the industry on and off, not that uh, we have heard any sort of discriminatory procedures that are being applied to Indian exports in Canada and vice versa. The rules uh, based or the rules based uh, system is pretty well followed. Uh, at the same time, uh, the growth pattern has been consistent. The only reason uh, why we feel that the only way that we feel that can really, really accelerate the growth is diversification of our uh, uh, merchandise and service exports. We need to really diversify the areas in which we collaborate. As the Canadian Minister on said, that 65% of the GDP comes from traders. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's definitely now given that uh, there is uh, the figures are very, very small and there is a big potential to grow. And diversification of uh, goods uh, that are being traded between the two nations will really, really play a big role in the years to come. Thank you. Certainly, it's not the least goal. Uh, floor is yours. Hopefully, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Right, okay. Thanks very much, uh, Ravi, to you and Pramod and the uh, ICCC for bringing us together and humbled by the presence of our, our ambassadors and high commissioners on both sides here. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a real privilege to follow. Um, let me just say a few quick things. When I ask CEOs, you know, how has COVID impacted your business? The single fast, the answer I get back most from everybody is acceleration. Everything has just been accelerated. So I'm hoping in that spirit, the same thing will happen to the India Canada relationship, because quite frankly, we've been, we've, we've done a lot of good things, but boy, we can really take it to the next level. If we leverage this moment, uh, where everybody seems to be wanting to act much faster, including governments are moving much faster. 
uh, than they've ever done before. So I, I lay that gauntlet down as a challenge to both businesses and government to seize the moment uh, in terms of, the, of, of uh, accelerating this relationship, which is off to a good start, but can certainly be taken to greater heights. Um, and we certainly feel that way in, in the business community. Uh, as you well know, and uh, the panelists and others would know here, diversification is key to Canada's trade policy. That was the case before COVID. It's probably even more so the case after COVID. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of conversations around the world about onshoring and nearshoring and so forth. Uh, my own view is be careful. Uh, you know, the human behavior is still going to be the same when this is all over. They're going to want the best products at the cheapest price. So while it might might make sense to get things done in your local community, the fact is businesses are going to continue to be looking at the competitive landscapes in which they can invest, uh, in which they can uh, you know bring products to market uh, effectively, efficiently, and reliably uh, for their for their consumers. The other thing I would say is is that um, you know despite the, the success stories that both uh, our high commissioners have, have alluded to. Um, the fact is that, that um, including with some of the challenges that remain, we still don't have a FIPA. We're not, we're long ways from any kind of a, of a, of a, of a formal trade agreement. Um, I've mentioned to both our high commissioners the importance that businesses put on structure. It's nice to have frameworks. It's nice to have some structures that um, uh, provide more confidence that the, the regimes are reliable, that there is predictability as much as one can have uh, in, in, in democracies and in regulatory um, uh, practices of, of both sides. And so we would welcome uh, more formalizing of the India-Canada relationship. Canadians, as you know, are traders. We like trade deals. We've had a lot of trade success. Um, and many businesses now are looking to our TPP and CETA and, and the strength of NAFTA. Uh, perhaps a UK deal somewhere down the road here as, as places in which to, to focus on because of the predictability that trade agreements do offer. So I challenge and again, put down the gauntlet that says, let's use this moment to maybe um, accelerate uh, our ability to get to that, you know, that finish line on at least FIPA, which we've been at for such a long um, uh, period of time. Uh, having said that, the fact is business continues. Uh, both our high commissioners alluded to the numer and our ministers uh, alluded to the, the numerical success. Uh, the B2B side, the business investments continue. I mean, from our side, you know, BMO and Brookfield and SNC and Air Canada, RBC, you know, Sun Life, CAE, of course, um, you know, Fairfax. Th th these are these are just the beginning of how much more opportunities there will be for Canadian businesses. Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's all about people, it's all about relationships, and I think that uh, it's the forums like this that make it possible for us to work around the margins of some of the challenges that do remain. Um, we just simply continue to do business. And in that spirit, uh, you know, uh, uh, it would be um, negligent of me not to say that these, these forums tend to focus on business in India. Um, you know, we welcome investment to Canada. <laughs> And, uh, and I think that there's tremendous opportunity for Indian businesses and Indian uh, to, to come and do the same here. And that will only further our relationships and our people to people ties. Thank you. So I'm gonna pick up on a theme that the two high commissioners mentioned, uh, the two ministers mentioned, that is the COVID is here and now there's a over that and then we move on to our generic uh, business relationship. Uh, High Commissioner of India mentioned about the vaccine example and uh, High Commissioner Patel mentioned about the near term. So I'm going to throw a question. If you want to think outside the box and we say we're going to have a short term finite agreement for only five years. And this will be in this area because of the COVID to get both the countries up and running. What areas do you think and how do you think these could be structured so that it's an add on and not a continuum of the previous discussions we've been having for the last 15 years. So Goldie, I'll go with you first. Well, that, you, know, you can spend the whole session on that on that question. I'm just gonna pick one. Uh, I, I'm going to say trade enabling infrastructure on both sides uh, would go a long ways in, in, in bringing about confidence again, that if you are going to invest you know, hard earned capital on behalf of your shareholders, uh, that there's an actual opportunity to move the product, not just to move the product internally in your country, which I admit as a Canadian, we have our own challenges on that with interprovincial trade barriers and so forth. So we would love to see trade enabling infrastructure and trade enabling regulatory uh, environment in which to, in which to um, uh, bring about that confidence I speak about. So Ms. Rupa, would you like to offer your thoughts or comments on it? It's okay to disagree or agree, that's fine. You're on mute, yeah. 
Okay. I would like to suggest smart cities because I think there's a huge potential in India for investment in smart cities. Of course, there are others like the digital technologies or the renewable energy, but smart cities can take off if Canada comes in here to invest in our uh, different cities, which have been uh, announced as most potential smart cities in the country. And as you know, India is one of the most leading countries with the youth population growing. We have, uh, as everybody has been saying, that uh, we've had a pandemic which has hit us very badly. But I can tell you, because I've been going to office for the last uh, two months from June, and I've seen people are really looking forward to coming back and working, and most of them are working. Even if there is 10% of them working from offices or from factories, the production is back. I don't see any reason they are going to be, uh, you know, uh, going to suffer any kind of uh, slowdown. So this is the time when Canada should take an opportunity and try and come to India and invest in smart cities because that's one of the projects which really needs to take off. Vikram, then, from a SME lens, you know, I know that small medium enterprise, and I belong to one right now, I, I, and you know, you don't want too many regulations. You would like to actually get the thing going sometimes. That's an SME focus. Do you see any areas that you can say, okay, let us agree to, you know, on the main terms for the five year period, seven year period, but let's do this now. And we put a, a limit to it, let's say two years, just so that both the countries benefit from uh, such a, you know, call it a case study, call it a, a short term venture. What would those look like? So I'll offer you two perspectives. One is from a small business lens and one is from what we could do now that is hot on the anvil. So uh, from a small business perspective, Toronto Business Development Center has been engaged with a whole bunch of incubators, uh, including Startup India, including T-Hub, and a number of other uh, very high quality um, uh, greenhouses that are incubating uh, very high potential and high growth uh, companies in India. And likewise, because small businesses are less uh, agnostic to um, government policy on uh, on uh, uh, and find innovative ways to get in. Um, I think that's one of the areas that is ripe for both countries to take innovators and bring them to closer to their markets, uh, invest in them, and then obviously provide all the support that they need. The uh, second part of it is education. Uh, Government of India has obviously announced um, the ability for foreign universities to go and in, uh, invest in campuses in India. India's uh, got an insatiable hunger on um, doing uh, high quality education. And uh, obviously, Canada has distinguished itself in India as a provider of great quality education, perhaps this is the moment where Canadian universities can make that long awaited outreach into India and uh, create a footprint for themselves, uh, which would obviously be an export of the Canadian education sector. And on the flip side, it would benefit Indians in tremendous ways. Thank you, Mr. Singla, I'm gonna put you in a little bit of a spot. I think this is where Goldie was talking about also trade and relations inwards or inbound into Canada as well. What would you think could be one or two things that you would like to see from the government of India in the very short term, call it the COVID recovery, bootstrapping, whatever, which allows this thing to happen uh, such that there is a bi-directional flow of both talent, people, and resources? <laughs> I will uh, try and take a cue from what the uh, Honorable Excellency Mr. Ajay Bisaria said in his uh, speech. I would like to create a bubble, uh, like a like a bilateral bubble, as we are doing in a lot of our commercial civil uh, flights. This, uh, we should uh, we can look at establishing a bilateral trade and investment bubble, wherein different sectors can be chosen uh, depending on the importance uh, between both the, both the two countries, and we can create a SME joint venture connect program. So. The biggest problem that I see is not the governance. It's, it's not the challenge. The, there's not uh, any sort of uh, inhibitions on rules and regulations that the companies are facing. The, um, the large companies, the large Canadian companies are already in India. Very large Indian companies are already in Canada. 
The bigger problem is faced by the smaller companies, the SME sector. And the biggest problem out of all of that is choosing a right partner. I have been to so many discussions and so many negotiations. The biggest problem that I see is people are hungry for networking. They need to find the right partner. They need to find the right information about what business to do, how to do, what are the rules, what are the regulations. Information is the biggest challenge. If we can create a very, a very robust uh, information bubble while connecting uh, business entities from both the sides in a very, very curated manner. Of course, it is the job of uh, IEEE and organizations like ours. We have to do it very, very rigorously and we have to do it in a very, very uh, planned manner. I'm sure more and more and more small and medium enterprises will connect with each other. They will have more joint ventures. They will have more transfer of technologies, skills, small micro level investments will start flowing in to India. They will also start uh, understanding the new regime, the, how new rules and regulations, how incentives are rolling out in different parts of the country and uh, how businesses can really benefit if they are in India at this moment. The biggest challenge still remains networking, connecting, connecting with the right person at the right time. So my idea would be to create a network bubble. Okay, so this leads me to the next question. I know many of you touched is the innovation chain. I go back to the report that I co-authored with the then Governor General of Canada called the Canada India SNT Mapping Study, which led to the bilateral agreement of 2004 between the two, with, with Gita on one side and uh, DFAID on the other side. It has seen three verifications every five years, but I must feel say that it's a little disappointed, disappointing simply because innovation requires people process movement seamlessly across the border. Even though geographically we are spaced, it must appear to be sort of almost transparent to take it in and out, in and out, because an innovation chain may have like five, six partners, three maybe from Canada, two somewhere else, two from India, whatever. That is seeming to be an impediment because the process, the various regulations, the various other rules that come up because of other country regulations, what seems to be an impediment. So you need to almost sort of go and create a, a kind of a hub that GE has done or I, uh, Wipro has done or whoever, which is not possible for some of the emerging technologies. I can talk about energy storage. Uh, I've done fair bits of work now in Bangalore, Calcutta on electric vehicle infrastructure. How do we get manufacturing of batteries and inverters? And the and every time we hit on these structural issues as opposed to idea people and uh, other issues. So I'm going to begin now with uh, Vikram. Vikram, how do you see this innovation chain meandering and what should be eliminated, if I can be bold enough to say that, so that it meanders much faster? Uh, so I think it'd be safe to say that if you have an innovation that's so compelling, um, it, it doesn't meander for very long. BlackBerry is a good example. Uh, it found in instant acceptance among Indian uh, consumers. Um, and I think uh, if you look at pharma, since both men, many speakers have talked about pharma, uh, insulin was discovered in Canada and one of the largest populations living with diabetes is in India. Um, we just have to find the right areas to bring that innovation forward and get that to move a lot faster. Um, expiry of drug patents between 2019 and 2024, which is the time period that we are discussing, is estimated to be around $212 billion. And um, the pharmaceutical industry in India is the world's third largest in terms of volume. But in terms of innovation, Canada can really help the industry, which has a ways to go in R&D. Uh, in R&D, for example, there is, uh, it takes an innovator about $1.5 billion. Uh, the U.S. has about 15,000 PhDs uh, compared to 2,200 PhDs who are specifically engaged in drug discovery, as an example. Um, Canada can definitely augment that researcher base by providing already technologies that have been developed in Canadian hospitals or biotech firms and get them to be uh, consumed or otherwise further developed in India as a, as a good example of bringing that innovation uh, that is meaningful uh, to the market. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Nayak, I'm going to put you on a spot here. Being a trade uh, specialist and an and a author of many initiatives, 
what would be the one policy change you would recommend to a state government or a federal government that allows for this fast and rapid meandering of people, processes, and ideas across the two borders? I don't think I need any policy change in this. It's a, it's a mindset. We need to change the way we think. I really think there's very little we should be asking for the government except for making things easier in terms of ease of doing business. But um, I, I really think that we really need to connect. As Mr. Singla said, we really need more connection and networking to enhance our businesses and to enhance our investments between the two countries. May I take this opportunity to just inform you that we have started a virtual trade exhibition uh, wherein any country can participate. And I'd like to invite Canada to be a part of this because this is mainly meant for the SMEs to connect across different countries. And you would really like to invite ICC to be a part of this. And policy changes, I'm really not that very much bothered. I'm only waiting for the uh, agreement to be signed, which has taken almost 10 years. And I hope with such agreements, we will be able to um, get across the various barriers that have kept us from doing bigger businesses in so many years. But I'm sure with the pandemic, we will be able to uh, navigate through these impediments that have been passing, we have been passing through. And I wish both the countries all the best and the policymakers. And Mr. Ajay Bhutaria is here, who is one of the most dynamic uh, ambassadors I have met before. And uh, probably we have, I don't know whether he remembers me, I'd like to say hello to him here on this platform and invite him also to come uh, to some of our uh, events that we're doing with Canada, with the World Trade Centers in Canada. There are many more World Trade Centers. So as far as policy is concerned, I really don't think there's much I would like to recommend because it's more business that we really need to do. Business will need to network more and meet each other and discover more partnerships. That's the platform that we really need to develop. Thank you. Given just five minutes left, uh, Goldie, I'm going to put you in a little bit of a spot here. Given the geopolitics that exists in our part of the North American world and in part of the Indian world, a lot of changes have taken place in the last two, three years. Whether it is regionalism, whether it is protectionism, whether it is policy changes across the border with the United States, tariff, counter tariff, reduction over 24 hours, whatever. It appears that everybody is on edge to get something that they want as opposed to share. How do you think that you will be able to sort of suggest one or two things, given all the big investments that has gone in there? It has largely gone in the area of patient capital, patient returns, uh, you know, pension funds, airports, all in the safe sectors of the Indian economy, as opposed to the true investment side of the Indian economy, except for Fair Fairfax Financial, perhaps through their companies. What would your ideas be given all these noise that is within our own domestic economies in each country? What would be one or two that allows us to still play the chorus, play the song, you know, and, and be a choir as opposed to getting caught with these regionalisms and geopolitics? Wow, wow. thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, I'm going to be a little philosophical first and saying, you know, my wife saw something on the internet back in March and it said, are, are we the virus and is COVID the vaccine? And I found that very profound and I remember it very well because it, it actually helps me answer a lot of questions like that because I think it's fascinating to hear how, how people are going narrow, how they are going small in their thinking, how they are trying to go to their respective corners. They don't want to engage. It's me, you know, not we. And it is, uh, you know, more protectionism as opposed to multilateralism. And when you think about the virus itself, um, the solutions are very much together. Uh, you know, the hashtag in Canada is, you know, in this together. Yeah, but that can't just be just a hashtag. It has to be a philosophy and an ideology of how we're going to get out of this. Because as, uh, as His Excellency, um, you know, um, um, Mr. Basaria has said that, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's going to take a, a, a global interconnectivity to have the distributions chains to get that vaccine out the door and, and into the hands of other people around the world. So even if Canada or India discovered the secret sauce, it's no good if we hoard it. It's no good if we just keep it to ourselves. It only works 
if we're actually able to ensure that it is globally shared, you know, and, and, and I think that this is uh, back to that philosophical point, there's a reason all this happens. And I wonder whether if in fact, you know, we're, we're focused on the here and now, but the ultimate outcome of all of this is it's a resurgence of multilateralism, a resurgence of globalization, a reminder of just how interconnected we are, not just from the health crisis, but how can a global recession be turned around if, if you don't help each other? If, if, if my economy does well, but yours doesn't, the odds are mine's not gonna do very, very well very long. We all have to turn our economies around. We all have to turn our health, uh, you know, into into uh, uh, you know re returning to some some old normal, if you will, in terms of being uh, not threatened by a virus. So I'm, you know, I'm optimistic, uh, if I can be, that that over time, even those naysayers who are running to their respective corners and trying to think about me as opposed to us, um, are going to realize that that is a recipe for failure. You cannot succeed anymore on your own, if, not on the health issue, not on the economic issue. And so I hope over a course of time, people will, in, from a business perspective, it can't be fast enough, realize that we are more than just in this together. We need to solve our problems together. And I think that the health arena that, uh, that the High Commissioner has alluded to represents a real win-win for everybody involved. We're doing ourselves a favor, but we're doing the whole world a favor. If we're able to you know, discover the vaccine, produce the vaccine, get the logistics behind sharing the vaccine in an accelerated way, uh, that, would, that would do a great service to humanity and hopefully be a reminder that it was done in a multilateral way, that it wasn't done by just somebody in their own. We, we needed each other to get it to the other side. Do you know that a ventilator has 1,400 parts in it? So even if we decided we're gonna make our own ventilators, the odds are pretty high that there are many parts that are going to come from many other countries to be able to produce that ventilator. And so I, I think we should all uh, reflect on some of those things and rise to the, to the challenge and not be shy about taking on the populists uh, who are all now winning the, you know, the agenda around the world about protectionism and remind them you know, how to get out of this mess is very much, uh, uh, very much uh, together. So I guess my answer is more philosophical, but I would say that we can just start somewhere. And if health seems to be the right place to start as an, as an area that's not the, in the traditional areas, because it's not in the traditional areas, why not start there? So on that, I'm going to ask the next question to Mr. Singla. This is something that Mr. Ambassador Khan Bhargav was an advisor to our chamber, and he has been my mentor for many decades. He passed away a couple of months ago. And he said, you know, in diplomacy, there are no permanent friends. There are only permanent interests. And that seems to sort of always stick with me and so, Mr. Singla, I've got this question. I, I would have loved to have posed this to Ms., uh, the High Commissioner, uh, but I'm going to pose it to you and put you in a spot there. If you look at the entire geopolitics, uh, Canada has not had any sort of strategic interests in the Far East, whether you look at South Asia, ASEAN, ASEAN plus four, et cetera. And neither has, has India. India has always believed in the non-aligned mo non movement, has been also on its own. And now we are discovering that I wish we had a strategic alignment, much like Canada's participation in NATO or Canada's participation in USMC, you know, things like that, that bonds you together when times are tough, you have at least some thick blood that ties you to come and work with each other. So the question I have is notwithstanding SEPA and all that, that's taken almost a decade and we still don't know where we're headed with that. How do you see Given the geopolitical situation of India, uh, both foreign diplomacy as well as its own domestic, where do you see Canada wanting to make an overture to India saying, you know what, we are ready to talk in this area. And then India to say, yeah, you know what, we'd love to hear from you. What do you think that is? I think it's a very difficult question, but I think we need to sort of address some of these specific issues if we are to get anything going. Uh, Mr. Singler, please. You're on mute. Yeah, yeah, now you're okay. So Ravi, last part of your question, I couldn't hear the your voice wasn't clear to me. Okay. The point I'm trying to make here is that strategic alliances help sometimes when times are tough. <clears throat> Canada, as you know, is a member of certain NATO, part of USMC, and so there's a strategic alignment for historical reasons, which brings the brotherhood, so to speak, together. In the case of India, you had non-aligned movement for the good part of its since independence. 
Uh, and now you are beginning to have certain partnerships with the ASEAN countries uh, in, in its, uh, you know, sort of start. But we do not have a Canada-India strategic partnership or relationship that we can go back to uh, and say, you know what, we are cousin brothers and sisters after all, right? So if you were to establish such a linkage, what areas do you suggest or a policy area that you would suggest that says, you know what, let's make this a fresh start? Uh, instead of waiting for SEPA and others to bear fruit, uh, which has not happened in 10 years? Well, uh, I think uh, it is a question which ideally should be addressed to His Excellency. Yes, he I didn't want to. Actually, if I meet him, I would. I'm but... the one who's already to say something best. But uh, from the perspective, I, I would only, uh, I would want to comment only from the perspective of trade. Uh, the biggest uh, but the most common factor is that we are big democracies and we have respected the, the immigrant uh, Canada has respected the Indian immigration immigrants very well. They have settled very well. So there is no reason for a forced tie up that uh, per se you would require to call that we are contemporaries. It is a it is a known fact that we are contemporaries. The trade has uh, really done well over the period of time. The investments have done well. Agreements actually bring more uh, vision to the reality that is existing today. So if we talk of SEPA, it's, it, I don't know if it will add more uh, flexibility or uh, more uh, possibilities to the India Canada trade. But one thing that um, uh, that uh, minister addressed is the mode four of services. If it is relaxed, then we are looking at more engagement and travel, personal travel of uh, movement of people between the two countries. And this is something that will add more uh, vibrancy between the investments, uh, more networking, more trade. And I think such, such uh, collectiveness is much more than having a formal way of uh, engagement that uh, diplomats are uh, best uh, crafting at. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a job that uh, diplomacy is... Uh, very good at doing, but I think uh, we we need to look at uh, more engagement, and uh, that requires movement of natural people, and that is something that SIPA is going to address very well. So I'm really really looking forward to SIPA. Well, uh, High Commissioner Bissari has unmuted himself, so I wish I think you are planning to intervene and say a few words, uh, if you can, please. Yes, I think I think you you have really laid the trap for me, so uh, I couldn't resist uh, coming in on at, at this point. <laughs> so uh, I would say, uh, you know, there are two points. One, um, India and Canada are strategic partners. We entered into this uh, strategic partnership in 2015 formally, and we continue to have close heart to heart conversations, not all of which are in the public domain. But I would add to that that 2020 is certainly uh, an inflection point. I mean, I mean, if you look at it in the sweep of this century and perhaps even for uh, coming years, this is a very important inflection point for geopolitics and for all the issues you mentioned. You know, we have a virus coming in from China, which has uh, uh, put the world upside down. It's a, a huge pandemic that has affected every country in the world. The public health crisis is followed by an economic crisis, which is unsettling everyone in the world. Goldie referred to the, uh, the uh, questioning of multilateralism itself and the geopolitics that is altering. Now, the Chinese behavior, let's face it, has been extraordinary in this year. The Chinese belligerence in its neighborhood, China's breaking of rules uh, globally, hostage diplomacy, debt diplomacy. So China's behavior for all global powers has been a matter of concern. So I would say that uh, apart from uh, every country reviewing multilateralism uh, and the way they react to uh, you know, critical uh, supply chains and production lines, uh, countries are also reviewing uh, their uh, relationship uh, with China, they're either uh, reviewing or pressing the reset button on it. There's a reset button also on uh, considering what you mentioned, the Indo-Pacific region. And India, of course, as you know, uh, in that region has been active. The uh, look East policy was followed by an act East uh, policy 
followed by greater activism in the Indo-Pacific. So that is the larger geopolitical context in which we operate. And we continue to have these discussions. And it's important to ask these questions of how company, uh, countries will land, or where they will land after these, uh, this introspection on uh, how they are dealing with uh, A, uh, China, and B, uh, the entire region of the Indo-Pacific. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. With that, normally moderators never summarize, they never close. That's one of the unique privileges of being a moderator. But you can see that the line of questioning actually points to a new opening. Uh, an out-of-the-box thinking, hopefully, maybe something in the short haul that needs to be done immediately, notwithstanding where the longer period uh, issues can be resolved or not resolved. Uh, the geopolitics for me is very important. I also look at the emergence of multiple bilateralism as opposed to multilateral trade. Uh, I mentioned that in the Canadian Parliament to MPs many times in my addresses. And, and I so the world is changing. Uh, you look at the WTO itself, one would argue how effective it is. You look at the United Nations, one would argue how effective that is. Uh, and so there are some of these long institutions over the last 140, 80 years uh, may have served a useful purpose, may not have served a useful purpose, but maybe some remodeling needs to be done. So therefore, these bilateral country strategic agreements keeps us in the family. And, and I thought uh, if, to just put it on the table and not to provoke any sort of thoughts otherwise, but to keep it, I think it's very important. So with that, I know the chamber members are all taking copious notes and hopefully they'll enact some of these uh, conferences and track twos. I've been on several track twos both in India and in Canada. And I think it's time now we revisited this uh, since my time at the ICCC. Uh, so with that, Vijay, I'm gonna pass it back to you for your closing remarks and closing the session. So thank you very much. Thank you thank very you. much, uh, Ravi Sitapati ji. Um, thank you uh, all the panelists, um, Goldie, um, uh, Vikram, uh, Rupa ji, and, and Mohit ji. I think um, the term I was trying to figure out previously was catalyst. So at Tangentia, sorry, at, at ICCC, we definitely want to be the catalyst in the next five years, in the next 2020 to 2025. Uh, what we've tried to put out there as a vision by the ministers and then you know, uh, by, by the high commissioners, I think uh, we see ourselves as uh, the Indo-Canadian Chamber of Commerce as playing an important part as being the catalyst. I think we, we talked, especially for small businesses, um, SMEs, we talked big businesses can take care of themselves. And I think the one note that I think we, we talked about and Goldie did mention was Indian investment in Canada, which I truly believe as a small business uh, owner myself is something that businesses in India looking for growth. And it's not just the 2 billion Canadian economy that they should be looking at. They should be looking at the 20 billion US economy. That's a gateway from Canada. But on that note, um, you know, that's something that I think all of you, we've got a great panel, both the high commissioners. I think that uh, Pramodji is, is reason for us to have another one of these sessions with the US angle in as well. And I think that is, I think, uh, of value uh, and, and a different element of, that we can bring to the discussion as well. Uh, on that note, we'd like to thank our sponsors. Uh, we'd like to thank uh, Tangentia, which is a technology sponsor for today's event. Um, and um, as the ICCC, we'd like to also thank all our regular sponsors, our um, sponsors that that uh, are our uh, annual sponsors, gold, silver, bronze. Uh, we'd also like to thank uh, the sponsors, the sector sponsors. The moving on, the the, the sector sponsors and and. Um, uh, also, like to thank everybody that's attended this today's session. People uh, on Facebook that uh, that uh, you know, I know we had. I don't think we, had, we had any time for questions, but you know, we definitely I think have uh, made a great start to this thing, and 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 we will have more sessions like this. So, if you have any inquiries about today's webinar, or if you want to become a member of the ICCC, or want to know about the ICCC Small Business Assist Program, please write to ICCC at icconline.org. Uh, on that note, I'd like to ask uh, Pramodji last closing statements as the as the president of the ICCC. Uh, it is your privilege, so please go ahead and make a few last statements. Thank you. Pramodji, you're on mute. Uh, 
Thank you, Vijay. Uh, I would like to express uh, our sincere appreciation to His Excellency Mr. Bissaria for staying back till uh, uh, the uh, session uh, is getting concluded. And all the panelists who waited uh, patiently for, it has been almost two hours since we started. So thank you uh, individually, Mr. Haider, Mr. Singla, Mr. Kurana, and Ms. Nayak for uh, your different perspectives. And also a special thank you to Mr. Sitapati for uh, taking the time and uh, being available to moderate this session. I think we heard a lot of perspectives and uh, there are uh, several takeaways from today's session. And uh, we at the chamber would definitely take steps uh, to take the discussion forward and implement whatever we can and uh, to keep the good work uh, that everybody is uh, looking into. Thank you and uh, have an excellent day. Thank you. Thank you.